welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll be talking about oscillations. First, we'll review the math behind simple oscillators, and then we'll use that to derive the behavior of damped oscillators. For simple oscillators, the force is proportionate to the distance that a mass has moved away from equilibrium position. This gives the standard equation for the force, F equals minus Kx. This is a second order equation, and the most general solution to a second order equation involves two solutions, which means we need at least two boundary conditions or initial conditions to specify the trajectory completely. It has general solutions e to the root at and e to the minus root at. I don't know what their relative weights are yet, so I'm just going to give each of them an arbitrary constant a and b to weight them for now. In this case, a is going to depend on the constants of the equation. In our case, a is going to equal minus k over m, or the square root of a, which is negative, is going to equal i times the square root of k over m, which we call i times omega, where omega is the frequency of the oscillator. And the full equation looks like this x of t equals a e to the i omega t plus b e to the minus i omega t. To put this into a more standard form involving sines and cosines, we'll use Euler's formula, which says that e to the i a equals cosine a plus i sine a. To understand where this comes from, let's have a look at the complex plane. So this is the real direction, and this is the imaginary direction. So here's a point in the complex plane. The function e to the i a has a magnitude of 1, so it's basically going to look like a unit circle, and the angle it forms with the x-axis is going to be the angle a. So for a fixed angle a, I get a point on the complex plane, and we can use trigonometry to separate out the real and imaginary pieces. The real part is cosine of a, and the imaginary part is sine of a. Combining these into a single complex number, we get Euler's formula, which says that this point, e to the i a, is equal to cosine of a plus i times sine of a. Now I can use this formula to rewrite my trajectory. Although I have complex terms, I know that my trajectory must be purely real. So I can write this as a cosine omega t plus i sine omega t plus b cosine minus omega t plus i sine minus omega t. Since I know that these must be real, let me group terms again. I have a plus b times cosine omega t plus i times a minus b times sine omega t. Basically, what this is telling me is that a plus b must be purely real, and a minus b must be purely imaginary, since it's multiplied by i, and I know that x has to be real. This tells me that a and b must be complex conjugates of each other. That is enough constraints to let us rewrite this in the standard form, c times cosine omega t plus d sine omega t. Or equivalently, I can go back to this complex plane notation where I basically am writing things in polar coordinates, and I can write this as another constant f is cosine omega t plus some phase phi. These are all different ways of writing down the solution to a simple oscillator, and we'll be using these descriptions interchangeably throughout this course. Now that we understand simple oscillators, let's add in a damping term. This acts like a drag force on our object. Then our equation of motion is given by m x double dot is equal to minus kx, which is the spring force, plus the drag force, which is minus b times x dot. I'm going to divide through by m on both sides to get a more standard form of this equation. I'm going to call b over m 2 beta, which is the damping coefficient, which is basically measuring the amount of drag on a system of mass m. And I'm going to call k over m omega naught squared, and this is the natural frequency of the system. Then our equation of motion becomes x double dot plus 2 beta x dot plus omega naught squared x is equal to zero. This feels kind of reminiscent of a quadratic equation or something like that. I'm going to use this idea to construct a change of variables so that the equation of motion looks like u double dot is equal to a times u. This implies that the solution has the form x goes like e to the rt, but we don't know what r is yet. So what I'm going to do is take this as an ansatz and plug it into our equation of motion. 
And when I do that, I get r squared times e to the rt plus 2 beta r e to the rt plus omega naught squared e to the rt is equal to zero. Fortunately for us, all of the terms that involve e to the rt cancel out. So I can divide through by them and I end up with the equation r squared plus 2 beta r plus omega naught squared is equal to zero. And this is a quadratic equation and I can solve for r in terms of the other constants in my problem. This has solutions r equals plus or minus the square root of beta squared minus omega naught squared minus beta. Thus our full trajectory is going to be x of t is equal to a times e to the minus beta squared minus omega naught squared minus beta times t plus b e to the minus the square root of beta squared minus omega naught squared minus beta times t. I have different types of damping behavior for this system depending on whether beta is bigger or smaller than omega naught. So here's my equation of motion again but this time I've pulled out the e to the minus beta t term since this term is purely exponential decay. So I have three cases depending on whether beta is less than omega naught, greater than omega naught, or equal to omega naught. In the case that beta is less than omega naught, then the term inside the square root beta squared minus omega naught squared is negative. So that means that I get imaginary solutions. So what does this look like? So the e to the minus beta t term is exponentially decaying. So that's going to give me a solution that looks like this. And I have to multiply this now by an oscillatory term. So that term looks like this. When I multiply these together, this gives me something that looks oscillatory, but where the peaks are exponentially decaying according to e to the minus beta t. This case is called underdamped. When beta is greater than omega naught, the term in the square root is positive. I get either exponential growth or decay. But since the square root of beta squared minus omega naught squared is always going to be less than beta, both of these terms end up decaying exponentially. So what this looks like is a times some exponential decay that looks like e to the minus beta minus the square root of beta squared minus omega naught squared times t. So this is one exponential decay rate. And to that, I'm going to add the other exponential decay rate. So this is beta times e to the minus beta t plus the square root of beta squared minus omega naught squared t. So this is going to decay a little bit slower. When I add these together, I can get two different types of solutions. So one is going to be purely exponential decay when both signs of a and b are the same, so it can be positive or negative. And the other, when these have opposite signs, I'll end up with something that crosses the x-axis, reaches a peak, and then exponentially decays away. We call this case overdamped. And our last case is when beta is equal to omega naught. When beta is equal to omega naught, this term in the square root, beta squared minus omega naught squared, is equal to zero. So that basically means that we only have one solution that looks like a times e to the minus beta t. And we can't have that in these types of equations. We do have to have two linearly independent solutions for second order equations. So we can construct another solution by multiplying the first solution by t. So this gives us a solution that looks like a e to the minus beta t plus b times t times e to the minus beta t. Um, or I can rewrite this, I can pull out the e to the minus beta t and I have a e to the minus beta t times 1 plus c t. So we've got one term that has an exponential decay and one term that has linear growth. So we know that at long times exponential decay is going to win out over linear growth. So at long times, we know that this too is going to look like exponential decay. This case is called critically damped. In the next video, we'll discuss driven oscillators. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.